I'm sure you will agree with me that intersections are pretty interesting places, be they the intersections on the roads we travel, crossroads of civilization, or maybe the coffee shop where we researchers can come together and solve some vexing problem. But I tell you, these are also the places where you can expect the expected and the unexpected. Okay? Or as the title of my talk says, this is also the place where innovation is incubated. Or if I follow my favorite saying, these are also the places where buds of creativity blossom at intersections. I can talk about these intersections for a long time, but today I'm going to talk just about a few. Intersection among technologies, intersection between an engineer and a biologist, intersection between an engineer and a cardiologist, and intersection between an engineer and an NGO devoted to the community development. Ladies and gentlemen, if you haven't figured yet, I am an engineer. Well, before I get to the talk, I would like to share with you an image, a vision that has stayed with me from my childhood. And the reason I want to share that with you, because that's probably what laid the foundation for my passion for intersections. On a no moonlight, standing on the bank of Ganges, I'm waiting for a ceremony to start. I wanted the pilgrims to come and float their lamps which they place on lotus leaves and float them into the river. When the daylight subsided, when the darkness enveloped me, there I found one little lamp on a lotus leaf come floating on the river. A pilgrim had put that in. It was a lonely lamp, but for me, it was a beacon of hope. And then, lo and behold, there was another one, and then there were many. So what would look they like, we started with one lamp, we had a bunch of them. And then the mighty stream of the river, Ganges, it took some of these lamps away, tossed them, scattered them. Some of them submerged. For some of them, they continued their soul journey, lonely journey. But a few of them, they came together, intersected. They stayed there and in a, in a blaze of light, which was stunning to watch. So this image that you are seeing, it has stayed with me forever. It has gone into the streams of my consciousness. And whenever I need some comfort, some inspiration, I take this from my streams of consciousness. This image I also have used in my professional life. I have thought of these little lamps as islands of knowledge in different disciplines. And what I want them to do, these different disciplines, to come together and make a bridge, a bright bridge, to a very sustainable future. So when we are talking about a sustainable future, Let's stay there for a few seconds. Okay. Let's move forward, and let's think of year 2050. That will be approximately 35 years from today. And what we have to do is take a stock of all the problems we are facing today and then in the years to come. In 2003, in a conference, uh, Richard Smalley, eminent scientist and a Nobel Prize winner, he listed these 10 problems with energy being on the top. And I'm sure, ladies and gentlemen, if we sat together, have done this exercise before, we'll probably come up with the same list. Okay. Now, what is interesting about these problems is that they are intersecting, they are interconnected, they're global in nature, and they're complex in nature. They require multiple perspectives to solve them. Let's take persisting poverty as a problem. In 2011, approximately one billion people lived below the poverty line of $1.25 a day. Okay. In 2050, by some estimates, the population is going to be 9 billion. So going from 7.3 billion to 9 billion, we are adding 1.7 billion people, and most of them will be in the developing countries. So it doesn't take a whole lot of logic to figure it out, that in the coming years, we will have a lot of poor people if we don't do something remarkable between now and then. So if you want to solve the poverty problem, you want to alleviate poverty, you need to provide GDP, increase in the GDP. There is a direct correlation between the increase in GDP and the energy consumption. So if we are going to increase the GDP of these people, we'll have to consume a lot of energy. If we do that, there is going to be, unless we do something very different, a lot of carbon dioxide emission 
and the global and the temperature global temperature increase while most of them both of them are associated with environmental problems so if we really want to do to think of one problem that i want all of you to think about of all these 10 problems let's focus on the one following problem we want to solve we want to meet the needs of the people without degrading the environment we want to create a sustainable future if we want to do that we will need a set of powerful technologies. What are known as converging technologies, these are nanotechnology, biotechnology, information technology, and cognitive science, the brain. Each one of them is very transformative, and very transformative and very powerful. Take nanotechnology. It is considered to be the next industrial revolution, $3.7 trillion global market in a decade. But more interesting than that, it has a lot of new applications that we can follow. So nanometer deals with the scale from one nanometer to 100 nanometer, where one nanometer is one billionth of a meter. Let me give you a perspective on that. Every, every second, our nails, fingernails, they grow one nanometer. So in a day, 86,400 nanometer growth takes place on our fingernails, and we normally don't even observe it. It's a big number, but the growth is pretty small. So that's how a small nanometer is. Right? At that scale, a lot of new phenomena arise, new properties arise, and we can exploit them. We can exploit them to meet our energy needs. Shown at the bottom of the slide on the left is a variable, flexible solar cell. This solar cell will be 10 times cheaper than the current solar cells available. It will be half as efficient, but still five times better. Imagine wearing a solar cell, going around and having a cell phone in my pocket and I can charge it. I'm a walking energy harvester, so can you be. Okay? Or look at the other side, some special nanomaterial like carbon nanotubes, they tend to be hydrophobic. That means water doesn't touch them. Okay? So imagine a water pipe. I coat it on the inside with carbon nanotubes and the water will zip through it without touching the walls, no friction, no energy required to move the water. So these kinds of technologies that we are talking about, if we follow them, we can probably meet the energy needs that I talked about. Are the other three technologies, the biotechnology, information technology, cognitive science, they are equally important. But what is more important is the intersection of them. So I'm going to take the nanobio interface. On the left is shown a nano knife. This was in my intersection with a biologist. And this nano knife, two to three nanometer in diameter, it can cut a single cell like a cheese cutter without affecting the cell itself. On the right-hand side is shown a cell stretcher, which came from my intersection with a cardiologist who wanted to know how does cardiomyopathy takes place. Cardiomyopathy is a disease of the heart in which the heart has to work harder to pump your blood. So what we ended up doing, uh, having this cell stretcher, you can place a single cell on the right-hand side of the cell stretcher. You can take a healthy cell, you can take a cancerous cell, and you can understand the mechanical behavior of each of those cells. Force versus displacement. That information about a healthy cell and about a diseased cell will provide you clues as to how does a healthy cell become malignant. Importantly, it will also tell you what kind of drug we can use. All I have to do is take a drug and put it on the cell, and whichever drug brings the behavior of a diseased cell to that of a healthy cell, that's the drug of choice. Okay? Now let's move over and talk about an intersection between engineers and an NGO. About two years ago, we went to a village close to Chennai in India, 1,200 population, and what we wanted to do was to make this village sustainable. So we talked to the elders in the city and elders in the village, talked to people, and what they wanted was to convert their library, which is shown here, into a village information center. So what we did, we provided them one kilowatt of power, and that power was able to provide enough energy for the lights they use, for the computers they have, for the fans they were using. Okay? But interestingly, they also found a use that I had not thought of. They suddenly found that they have electricity available 24-7, and they can charge their cell phones free. In the past, they used to go to uh, depend on a, another worker or another uh, provider to provide them charge, uh, electricity for charging their cell phones. So right now, this is how that place looks like. Okay? 
Uh, there are people who are using the computers. They are getting connected to the world. And with this kind of relationship we have established with them, they are ready now to go to the next step. They want to replace all their 72 street lights with solar power lights. They want to have their irrigation power pumps powered by the solar light. So we are ready to take that, to uh, make that village totally sustainable. We are training the youth so that they can take this message to the next village and make it sustainable. So what I have done, I hope, through these examples, I have shared with you. I think I, maybe I have demonstrated to you. Then we, when we come together, when we intersect, and we make use of the current available technologies, we can make a difference. So let me, in conclusion, uh, reach, uh, reach, ask you to reach out and intersect with someone beyond your comfort zone. If we do that, we don't have to recall the example I gave you of the lamps. We don't have to depend on the random currents to make our intersections. Ladies and gentlemen, all of you, myself, all of us, we can pledge that what we do from today as engineers, as scientists, as humanists, as artists, as musicians, we go out together, reach out, intersect with somebody, learn from each other, take major problems facing the humanity, and we find solutions so that we can have a very bright, sustainable future with that bridge that we started with, but now you and I, not those pilgrims, will build it. Thank you very much.